So first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, sorry that I was a little late. Uh, you know, the time flies, so now it's five fifth year of the recent promotion. So, you know, I know that when, you know, getting older, that's my point. Uh, so, uh, next is uh, to say, I, my talk is minimal in, minimalistic and ambulatory tower program. So I'm going to talk about our program. To say that the first step that changed in our heart team meeting is to say that we are no longer evaluating surgical risk as a primary risk, tower risk as the primary risk. If the tower risk anatomy is low risk, then you know tower is a good option. And then if the surgical risk is only assessed if the tower risk is high. So this is a something very important change in concept. This is a slide or this is the uh, slide that we make for all patients, all our fellows make this uh, so that we have it in the cath lab. And this is very important because all the patients look equal or similar. So this is, uh, you know, history, T, CT analysis, and coronary heights, and what are the things that are important for the patient. Minimalistic uh, part is this, that the, although the room is large, and uh, we do have all the capabilities of having a heart pump, anesthesia, cardiac surgery, uh, we have nobody there. And uh, we don't, of course, use Swan Gans, uh, Artline, Foley, none of that. We do one side access, so this is another part of the minimal invasive side of it, that instead of doing two accesses on two sides, so the patients, at least when they go home, they don't feel that they had two sides groin invaded, so this is a simpler solution. We are using Sentinel device in all the patients, and for all of this, I have some data, so I'm going to share with you at the, uh, once I show the case. And then this one is, we have a biplane lab, so hemodynamics, and as you see the slide on the corner, uh, is done uh, for all the patients. Central device, as I pointed out, is uh, placed in all the patients currently. And when we deploy the valve, we deploy it in biplane. So we usually use the uh, cusp overlap method or isolation of the right uh, or non-coronary cusp and then deploy the valve so it is a little bit higher. Uh, and this is important because now with valve in valve and you know you just heard uh, uh, Dr. Bobert's talk that how uh, this is going to be important that where we deploy the valve. Uh, and then every patient, we measure the hemodynamics. Of course, uh, everybody does, but, you know, carefully so. And then this is something novel, too, that we do at the end of the procedure, is take the pacemaker out of the right ventricular apex, put it in the right atrium, and pace the right atrium at 120 beats per minute. So 90, 100, 110, and 120. And if they conduct one-to-one, -one, uh, then we think that this patient can be discharged. Uh, home uh, the same day. Uh, we remove the sheath from the top one, take a picture from the bottom sheath, so again simpler, uh, and then just to hold the pressure, take out the five French sheath from the bottom. Uh, so the bottom sheath is the one that we use uh, for uh, placing the straight flush catheter rather than a pigtail so that we can move the catheter easier. Uh, same day discharge in patients who meet the criteria, I'll go over this. Uh, Aspirin only for all the patients, and uh, if they have indication for uh, NOAC, then of course they will have the NOAC. Uh, if they have recent stand, sometimes we use the clopidogrel, and then they are followed at one to one day, post-op if they are discharged the same day, 30 days, six months, and one year. And the, if the gradients increase, then we do the CT scan. So just going over all the things, we have studied it systematically to say that GA versus MAC, uh, this is our data to say that you know in 2014 or so, we stopped doing the GA. Uh, and then we followed this patient over time to see that if there is any difference, because there is some argument made by some people that doing a TE is better and you can analyze the situation better. We didn't find that. Uh, the unilateral access in our situation was very safe. Uh, and the peripheral bailout is easier because we just go from the inferior sheath and we can put a stand, balloon, whatever we need to do. Uh, and we analyzed that too to say that unilateral access did not have a higher incidence of any complication. Uh, 
we also use one per close. We don't use two per closes. So we use single per close uh, for the uh, large sheath. Uh, and at the end, in about 66 to 70 percent of the patients, we need an angiocell device. So this is another thing that we studied to say that at least 30 percent of time we can save the second uh, device. And also we think that the complications re regarding the pinching of the artery is a little bit better. Sentinel device, why we are using it is because from 2017 or so when the device became available, we started using it in all the patients. And we have, similar to the uh, uh, protected tower trial, we had about 3,000 patients in Cleveland Clinic, 1,000 uh, without and 1,800 with uh, the sentinel protection. And 15 patients developed strokes uh, without and eight patients with sentinel device. And of the 15 patients who developed stroke with sentinel device, four patients died. And of the eight patients who developed sent stroke without, with sentinel device, nobody died. So the stroke size was smaller. So this is the reason why we continue to use this device. We studied the rapid atrial pacing uh, with uh, uh, also studying with Dr. Colombo's group uh, in Italy with Azim, uh, to, this is when he was there, to say that uh, we pace the patients, then discharge the patient. Uh, there are only two patients who required pacemaker in the first 30 days if they could conduct one one to one at 120 beats per minute. If they do, cannot conduct one to one, that does not mean that they have conduction abnormality. That just means that their AV node is blocking uh, the conduction, so it is AH or HV part is not very clear. So then, of course, we need to monitor them or whatever needs to be done. Feasibility of same, same day discharge. So we studied the feasibility of same day discharge. So uh, if you look at this, this is our protocol. So if we do the uh, conscious sedation tower, six hour post tower, if the patients are rhythm, do not show any abnormality, no major complication, uh, stable hemodynamics. Uh, comfortable ambulation post-procedure, then we discharge them. And then, of course, they have to come back the next day for another EKG groin check, uh, so they can stay in the hotel, or if they are very local, they can go to their home. And then four people who had uh, readmission with the same day discharge, one had rapid, rapid atrial fibrillation, one had pulmonary edema, one had GI bleed, and one had uh, uh, intermittent uh, conduction abnormality. Very, very similar to the people who were discharged the next day. So there was no difference uh, in outcomes. The only important thing in our situation, what leads to this is that if they have good social support and if we can finish the case by noon or so, then we are able to discharge them. If we are three or four o'clock, we finish. We, of course, don't discharge them at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, so this is uh, the situation. We also wrote a little paper with many of people here uh, to say that how we can use the same day discharge uh, as uh, in other situation. These are our data for last four years. So there are 3,000 patients. Uh, mortality is 0.4, uh, stroke is 0.5, uh, AR rate is 0.4, and new pacemaker rate is 2.9%. So these are all patients undergoing tower transfer, motor transit, you know, whatever alternative access and uh, in Cleveland Clinic. So I just want to conclude that it is a reproducible procedure with a safe and effective procedure. Excellent outcomes are feasible with minimalistic approach with careful attention to details and monitoring of outcomes. Bar is high because of their excellent outcomes with surgery in low risk patients. So monitoring of quality is very important for credibility of doing these kind of things. Thank you.